Welcome to Basket News Talks. I'm the host Donatas Urbanas and we're visiting uh, your league headquarters in Barcelona and we have this very huge privilege uh, to have the CEO of the EuroLeague, Marshall Glickman, as our guest. Thank you, Donatas. Thank you so much. Uh, I actually listened to your podcast, uh, which you recently had with Joe yeah, Arlauskas. Yeah. It was wonderful. And if you want uh, to have a better picture of Marshall's uh, approach on things, how he sees things, on his vision, I really recommend watching that video because I think it tells a lot uh, the, the way you see basketball and how he, he can be improved. The problem is that we have limited time. So I believe uh, we have to um, address some more important ongoing topics okay. without further uh, warm up. But let's, let's say for a short stretching, I just wonder how your morning looks like, how your inbox or WhatsApp chat history looks like the following morning after a hot year late night with some great games and some controversial games mm -hmm. like we had in Bologna yesterday, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that's a great question. I get a lot of text messages from Alex. I watch some games. I don't watch all games, right? I can't watch all games. So sometimes I don't even know what happened the night before until they tell me in the morning. But uh, no, when I get up in the morning, um, I usually have fresh orange juice and then go to the gym. And so my, you know, and I do my WhatsApps while I'm on the elliptical machine in the gym. That's my typical morning. But no, it's not, um, there's not been a, too much controversy. I try to not, I try to let our guys do their job and not interfere um, with sort of day-to-day -day basketball matters. My job is to try to grow your league and grow this business so that it's viable and it's economically sustainable over time. And I'd like to see the competition grow and I'd like to see a resolution to the broader ecosystem, right? Because this problem that we have between too many games EuroLeague, domestic leagues, cup competitions, uh, and the international competitions, it's too much. And so I agree with the comments that have been made that we've got to deal with this in a broader way. And we have some thoughts about that, but we would like to get uh, back to that. So, because I think if we can resolve the calendar sort of format questions uh, with FIBA, uh, then I think we can uh, have opportunities to take advantage of the fact that uh, every game matters, you know? I think that's a great thing about EuroLeague basketball. What is the most likely way to reach that, you know, compromise with FIBA? We're, are we talking about reducing uh, international windows, for instance, or maybe emerging EuroCup and BCL competitions? Um, I don't think we know yet, to be honest with you. We had one meeting, uh, Dayan and I met with FIBA uh, about a month ago, I guess, um, in Brussels. It was just a get to know you. It was a very casual, informal kind of meeting. But now we're putting together a committee uh, that's going to include representation from, I think, four of our clubs, myself, Dayan, and other people internally here. And we're putting ideas together that we would like to talk to them about. But we're not going to come in with the attitude of it's this way or that way. We don't want to come in with hard proposals. We want to come in with ideas and hopefully they'll bring ideas. And maybe the result is what you're saying. Maybe there's a window that we can make work. Um, I don't know yet. Maybe there's two windows. Maybe there's no windows. I think it depends. There's so many factors and it's admittedly it's complicated. The bottom line is with FIBA is we would like to collaborate. We'd like to coexist in a friendly, cooperative way. Uh, we respect uh, the idea that our players uh, should have the opportunity to play for their countries uh, and in meaning in national competitions, uh, but it's complicated. We also have a business to run. And so we have to look out for our business interests, but we're also interested in looking out for the interests of the domestic leagues and FIBA as well. It's been four months since you're running this business and to me it felt that this recent situation of Red Star Belgrade and Facundo Campasso was probably the most challenging for your leadership in I would say regulations uh, wise. Um, 
there were a lot of you know interested parties. There were there was a lot of pressure. The club, the agencies, uh, the Elpa players, Facundo Campasso by, by by himself, and you had this privilege to lift the ban, but you didn't. Uh, can you get us through that decision-making process? What you thought was right for the league, for the players, for the whole ecosystem, and why you decided, uh, you know, not to lift uh, that ban? Um, the formation of the ELPA was how many years ago now? Three. Three years ago. That's a big step forward. That there is a players' association. Then the framework agreement came forward. One of the biggest issues for the players, for very good reason, was we need to be paid and we need to be paid on time. So that's one of the several uh, topics that are addressed in the framework agreement, as you know. Um, the players weren't paid on time. Um, we have an independent body called the Management Control Commission that did deep investigations. Um, I don't want to get into the details of their work, but we're not involved. They're independent. They're truly independent. They're a group of three attorneys um, who have no baggage. They have nothing to do with basketball uh, directly. So they came to a conclusion um, that the club um, was not forthcoming with some information that was necessary. In the meantime, they were able to register players that otherwise they wouldn't have been able to register which gave them potentially a competitive advantage that they otherwise wouldn't have had. At the end of the day, um, I didn't, you know, the word amnesty, my, the only authority that we have, that I have as the CEO is amnesty. And amnesty means that you're making the whole thing go away as though it never happened. That's what it means. It wasn't a question of can Composo play or not play? It wasn't anything to do with Composo. It was to do with the, uh, my view is that we have to uphold the integrity of the system and particularly in a situation where we're doing precisely what the Players Association asked us to do uh, or the Management Control Commission, I should say, is doing that. So I didn't feel that it was at all appropriate for the CEO to step in and change something that had been going on for quite some time. And just just because this, I mean, I feel very bad for Campazzo personally, by the way. I would, obviously, all of us would like him on the court. That's not the question. And I've had, by the way, an exchange with him directly. Uh, but, uh, I think, didn't you talk to Mike James? Were you the guy that talked to Mike James? Yeah. I think he said it all. And I think we, uh, we did the right thing uh, by keeping our, I don't think it would have been appropriate for me to step in just because we all would like this one particular player to play. I think the, uh, my job is to defend the interests of all the players collectively. And I think if uh, Mr. Compasso has a complaint, he should be talking to his agents because his agents were well aware of the situation. Mm, at least there is that kind of rumor that Compasso's camp, regarding his agents, regard, uh, Compasso's camp, they, it, it feels like they were assured that there I, shouldn't I, be any problems. I don't know where they got Was that. Was that the case or just they like... Weren't assured by, they weren't assured by the CEO office. Nobody talked to me. I mean, I don't know where they got that assurance from. I don't know who would have given them that assurance. Uh, so as far as I know, uh, they, they weren't given a, the, the Management Control Commission is an independent body. They make recommendations and it goes to a financial panel and they implement the sanction, almost always based on the recommendation given by the Management Control Commission. So. There is no assurance that I'm aware of that was given from anybody. Did you talk with Campasso before his tweet? I remember he tweeted something in Spanish about, you know, your league just let me play or, or after. Well, if it was in Spanish, I couldn't read it. So he sent me a very nice email. It was very polite, very courteous. And I sent him back uh, a pretty lengthy email uh, explaining the situation. I feel really bad for him. I'd like to see him on the court. It's this is not. He pointed out that this is not his fault, and I agree with him, it's not his fault. Uh, but I do think that the, uh, the agents were well aware of the situation, 
and they chose to sign him there and then the sanction happened when the sanction happened. I can tell you also that I looked into it once it came to my desk. I looked into it and we took the time to make sure uh, that there was no uh, reason to give amnesty, you know, that there was no mistake or whatever. Obviously, if there could have been some other sanction, people have suggested there could have been some other sanction and things like that. But the sanctions are given because they need to have an effect. And I don't think, uh, I think their view, the view of the Management Control Commission is money wouldn't have solved the problem. There was an idea that maybe it would be possible to imp impose the sanctions for the club, like increasing the fine or That's making I, some future decisions. Uh, I just said, the, 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 I, again, it's not up to me. The opinion of the Management Control Commission and the financial panel is that this problem was not going to be solved by money. Let's talk about some positive things. Luka Doncic just recently did amazing uh, advertise for, for EuroLeague products. God bless Luka. We, we all love, love Luka. He, he did an amazing job. This video went viral. Everybody is, is yeah. proud of Luka. We all love him. But you know, listening to his quote, uh, to his words, I was thinking, I, I just remember the situation with Kevin Durant coming to Monaco and Pereira's last season. And I thought, is it possible to make something out of it as a league? Uh, I mean, to capital, capitalize on it, I don't know, it's, it's a brainstorming process, but to, to create some, some merchandise, uh, some, some jerseys, to, to, to ask them to be ambassadors of the game when the final four comes or to, to, throughout the regular season. Did you have this, you know, out of the box thinking what we could do about it as an organization, not to leave it as, you know, one time amazing tweet? Well, Luke is not the only one because Giannis has made comments, there's been several players, even American players, who have made comments. I think even Kevin Durant made some, didn't he say something about wanting to play here at the end of his career or something like that? Yeah. I mean, so there's actually several comments that have been made over a period of time. Of course, I'm, I'm a marketing guy, I'm, a, you know, I'm all over that. I'm encouraging that we use all of our platforms to uh, I think I saw, didn't I see a t-shirt? I think I saw a t-shirt online. I think it wasn't a real t-shirt. I think it's like a digital t-shirt, right? So maybe there'll be t-shirts. I mean, I love it, obviously. When players are, are, are pointing out what is the positives about European basketball, I think we need to do exactly what you're saying, which is emphasize that and uh, put it out there. Um, but we need to, um, you know, we need, we need more resources in order to do more marketing and we need to capture Gen Z's and make it more exciting. I want this to be a player's league. I mean, one of the issues is, is it a player's league or is it a coach's league? In my view, the players are the stars. The players need to be put forward and we're making some changes in that direction and we'll continue to. How to make it uh, a player's league, for instance? What would be three most easiest ways to reach in the short term? Um, by giving them the freedom to use their social media platforms, giving them the freedom to use their voice, by taking our digital content and our all forms of our content and putting the players out there more. I think people are interested in our players in terms of their lives and our players as people not only as basketball players, and I think that's part of the secret of the NBA is that the players are relatable, whether it's through fashion, whether it's through fitness, whether it's through health and nutrition, whether it's through causes that they care about. Um, you know, a lot of our players have really begun to be vo use their voices and use their platforms, I think, in generally positive ways. And I think the more we can find different ways through our players to relate to people instead of just basketball fans, I think that's to our advantage. But, you know, none of this is easy. We need to also expand, ultimately, I think, into some important markets. And that's a really high priority. So if we can begin to penetrate in London, Paris, these kinds of markets, I think we're going to see a lot more success. Yeah, speaking of these huge markets and big players, I believe 
I remember we did a podcast before the season about top uh, winners and losers of the off season. And I remember I mentioned that I think that the biggest losers of that off season were Euroleague fans, maybe Euroleague organization itself because of losing Victor Van Banyama mm. to some other competition, yeah. in particular the domestic league. And I, I was just wondering if you were in charge, let's say, was there anything you could do to try to convince him to find some agreement just to stay in Euroleague or at least EuroCup environment? Because losing the Maniama, losing all this exposure and his greatness on the courts, yeah. it's, it's, it, yeah, it's pain in heart. Um, I would like to be in a position where we could have as a league, meaning the clubs collectively, because we're the clubs, right? We're, we're here on behalf of the clubs. Could have intervened somehow. Uh, I think though the reality, given Victor's situation, given his age, given this transition that he's obviously gonna make from playing European ball to going to the NBA as the number one pick next year, I think it's fair to assume, uh, I'm sure the advisors around him are telling him, you know, let's let's de-risk the situation as much as possible. So I think they're probably looking at this as how do we play fewer games this year, not more games? Maybe how do we play in a less intense comp competitive environment so you you know you're not risking injury. Uh, and then how do we put you in a situation where you can pretty much do your own thing, right? To, to kind of showcase your talents. Whereas here, as you know, the coaches want to win games. That's their priority. I understand that. So maybe his role in a EuroLeague environment wouldn't be the same as the role he has where he is now, where he has more freedom to kind of just ball. Um, so I understand it from a kind of business perspective from his perspective, I don't mean him personally. Uh, from our perspective, you're a hundred percent right. We would have liked him to, you know, it would have been great if this year could have been his send off. Um, I want to have more cooperation with the NBA. We're meeting with the NBA in Paris next week and we're going to talk about that because my feeling is when a Euroleague player graduates to the NBA, we should be celebrating that. We should be excited about that. And, 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 and I want to see more of that. And when a guy comes from the NBA back to here, we should be celebrating welcome home. And when an American player chooses to play here instead of the NBA, we should be celebrating that too. And we should be capturing, in my view, their journey. You know, the whole journey. I mean, I don't, we were talking about Mike James, and I know he went to Grant High School in my hometown of Portland, Oregon. When I lived in Portland, Oregon, I never heard of Mike James. I'm sure he was probably the best high school basketball player in the city of Portland. It's not a big city. He had to be one of the best two or three players. There aren't that many that get to that level, right? Did he play college ball somewhere? I believe that he might have been under the radar because even in Europe, he started from like second lower division. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, but to me, what would be super cool is if we could have these cameras sort of following him around from the beginning. I mean, wouldn't it be great if we had a way to follow the journey? To me, that's what's so interesting over here is the journey these guys take. European guys that come up through the academy system and through the club system. Some go get a cup of coffee in the NBA and come back. Some make it and, and become stars. Then you've got American guys. I'm interested in these American guys with 25% of our players, American guys, you know, that are coming over here. And what's it like to make the transition culturally? What's it like for their families and their kids living over here? To me, that's really interesting. And uh, there's so many, we're a really diverse league and there's so many great stories, underlying stories behind it. So I wish we could, and, I, and I'm pushing internally to be in a position where we can capture the journey of all these players, because I think that's just so interesting. There's a basketball journey and there's a personal journey. And I think those things blend together. And I think that's interesting to people. It, it touched some good points. And I now I have this feeling we 
previously we had these NBA Europe games. Yep. And I don't remember anything like that for a few this years. This is true. Didn't we lost some track or relationship with the NBA? What we could, you know, bring back again? Yeah, I'm going to try to reset that relationship. Uh, I had something to do with the original, uh, what do we call it, NBA, what was it called? NBA Europe games or whatever it was, but we had, there were some games that were NBA versus NBA, but that there were several NBA versus EuroLeague games. It was a great situation. Uh, I was involved in those discussions as a consultant uh, to EuroLeague back then. And I got to be honest, I don't know what's happened to the relationship. I think the relationship is fine on a personal level, but I don't know what's changed to why those games have gone away, other ways we could be cooperating. We could be cooperating in business ways. We could be cooperating as far as the, the game, the rules of the game, how the games are officiated. There's a lot of things we could be doing together uh, in collaboration. I think part of this is also resetting our relationship with FIBA. So, because the NBA sits on the board of FIBA, Mark Tatum is on the board. So I think if we can reset our relationship with FIBA, that there's that kind of links to, you know, the NBA. So I'm walking in, I, we have a short window with the NBA because they're so busy in Paris, but we have meetings this coming week and I'm looking forward to that. I'm also going to Salt Lake for the All-Star Weekend. I'm gonna see a lot of people there and I'm with you. I, I think it's time to talk about, because after all, we're feeding the NBA is probably 25% national, um, international players, maybe more, most of whom are coming from Europe and many of whom are coming from our key countries and our key clubs. And so uh, we're, we're a feeder system for their future stars. So we ought to be cooperating more. And I'm going to be as innovative as possible to see that that happens. Any ideas how to solve this huge problem, the, the amount of the NBA buyouts? This is... This is a very nice journey with all these stars yeah. they starting their journey in Europe, coming to the NBA, but the problem is that these clubs invest a lot of money, yeah. but they're not getting enough reward for that probably. And probably this conversation also includes FIBA, because I believe that they set the rules, right? This is a pretty complicated situation. Well, the NBA does, the, the NBA is a private business, so let's start with that. And the NBA is going to live by their own business interests. I mean, that's fundamentally the deal. But I agree with your underlying point, which is that we're making great investments on people who become players, who become their future stars, or just everyday players, either way. Um, and there ought to be a conversation about how we can have better cooperation. It's not necessarily only a money issue, right? <clears throat> So we need to talk about the whole ecosystem of basketball and how Europe and the NBA relate to each other. And we'll see where, where it goes. I, don't, I, I just don't know yet. I don't have any answers, uh, but I agree with your underlying premise. The topic where everybody has their own opinion is the Euroleague format, for sure. Mm. And there are a bunch of ideas already about improving the format of the Euroleague that already have been discussed, including uh, more playoff seeds, mm. uh, playing tournament, reducing the number of games, conferences, and etc. What do you think, what of these, which of these ideas are inevitable, let's say, and the most likely uh, to be integrated in the, in the EuroLeague in the following years, for example? Well, it goes hand in hand with expansion. So we're 18 clubs today. We have more demand for clubs than we have slots for clubs. This is an enviable position. I'm happy to be in this position, right? We have two parties right now actively that are credible, legitimate parties in Paris that want a EuroLeague team in Paris. The existing Paris basket ownership group wants to be a EuroLeague team. And then there's another group that's out there that um, wants to be a EuroLeague team, and I'll just leave it at that for now. The London Lions want to be a EuroLeague team as soon as possible, okay? The club that we have in Monaco, which got in originally by winning Euro Cup and is there, they play in a subpar arena, but I was there last week and I met with the prime minister of the country, or the principality, I should say, 
and they are, uh, I'm not going to yet say committed, but they're quite serious about pursuing a new arena in Monaco. They want to be a year league team permanently, right? We have two clubs in Belgrade, both of which Red Star and Partizan want to be your league teams. We have Vertus Bologna wanting to be a year league team. We have a beautiful brand new arena in Valencia, Spain. They want to be permanently a year league team. Kind of hard to run a business when you're in one year, you're out the next year, maybe you're back. That's not, you know, but we have an open, you know, we have to be an open league to some extent. So the Euro Cup champion gets promoted. So I do think, to answer your question specifically, that expansion, meaning more teams, is inevitable. More teams means more games. But that's, there's only so many days in the year. The calendar, there, you know, and, and FIBA wants two windows. And the domestic leagues play playoffs. And there's cup competitions. So your point is probably going to conferences at some point is going to be necessary. We, I don't, we like this, this format home and away, right? This is good. If you're in Countess Lithuania, you know that Real Madrid's coming every year. Barca's coming every year. These big brand comes are coming. If we go to conferences, we're going to have to compromise that to some extent. Uh, I love the, uh, we need to expand the number of teams that play in the postseason or have the opportunity. So I'm very much in favor of the idea of a play in term, a, a play in system. I happen to like the NBA system because if you're the bottom clubs, you have to win twice, right? The other clubs only have to win one. I think that's cool. Adds drama. Uh, I'd like to see an all star game. I really Mike would. Too. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I, I think we should have an all-star game in the right market. Um, so all these things come back to your point about format and calendar. Uh, we're also looking into playing a game abroad, a regular season game, a real game somewhere else. Maybe it's New York City. Maybe it's Tokyo. Maybe it's Mumbai. Could be in a lot of places. But I think that's going to help kind of get the word out about the quality of our game, the intensity of our game, this whole slogan that we're using, every game matters, I think is just really accurate. I think that's a really, it's one of the best slogans I've ever heard in sports. Because most of the slogans you hear in sports are hype. You know what I mean by mm -hmm. hype? They're kind of, you know, but this one, I think it's true. Yeah, it's not made up. Yeah, it just feels authentic to me. It's like, yeah, every game matters. That's right. They treat every game like it matters. The coaches, it's like every game's the Super Bowl. <laughs> it's like, whoa, this is it, man. So I love that about our sport. And that's something that we have an advantage. You know, that's something different. Uh, in the NBA, I would say every game, it doesn't necessarily matter or it doesn't matter as much. You know, you always want to win. But um, so, yeah, I think we're going to have to look at format. I think we're going to have to be creative about it. Um, you know, I'd love to find some kind of a solution with FIBA and with ULUB where we could have a better balance between the EuroLeague and the, and the Euro Cup. Um, competition on the one hand, the, the, the European competitions and the domestic. I mean, it's really tough on the players to have to be playing on Thursday night somewhere and then have to travel back to their home market to play on the weekend. And they may have to go back on the road, you know, the next day. That's tough. And I'd like to find a solution for that. It's not easy. But my friend Diego across the hall has some pretty good ideas around this, and we're working on a whole range of possible solutions. And then we'll start talking to FIBA again, I think, in March, and seeing how they feel and what their reaction is to different ideas. When you mentioned, and also Mike James mentioned this NBA All-Star, your league All-Star idea, yeah. I'm sorry. I thought that it could be a great Thing to replace the whole concept of the Final Four to bring mm. EuroLeague stars to one place to mm. sell it as a product and then to have the 
extended playoff series, not just playing quarterfinal series, but also semifinals and finals. But in the recent interview on Squeak, I heard that you're not the fan of getting rid of the Final Four, right? Well, no, I like the Final Four a lot. I think it's cool. I, I love it. It, you know, obviously I come from the States, the NCAA Final Four single elimination allows a Cinderella to come through. It makes the game, you know, the one game is everything, right? So I think that's kind of nice. So I don't necessarily want to do away with the Final Four. It's an important, I think people are comfortable with it. I know some people would like to change it. Um, the issue is calendar. It, 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 at the end of the day, even if we wanted to lose the Final Four and go to a playoffs, it's still, how many dates are there? The domestic leagues are playing how many rounds of playoffs, Alex? At least three. Yeah, right. So, I mean, there's only so many days. I mean, it really comes down to that. So the Final Four is a compact way to determine who's going to be the champion and from year to year. And I like, I like the drama of that. So I don't think the All-Star replaces the Final Four. I don't see it that way. I think it's additive. But I think that the problem is that all these great ideas that we can think about comes down to the fact that the calendar is so packed. And right. if the solution won't be found, I'm not sure if we can actually do something more about it, right? So what maybe makes you be positive that we can reach the solution pretty well, soon? Well, I think if you, um, we're, we're, we're working on different ideas. But I mean, look, if you go to, if you go to um, conferences, that changes things considerably. I'm just saying. So you theoretically in a conference environment, if you had 20, 22, maybe ultimately 24 clubs, then you can play home and home like we do today inside your conference and you play home or away outside your conference. So that means you still play everybody, but you alternate years where you go play on the road versus play at home. That saves a lot of days. Um, and then there's, you know, without, I don't want to, there, there are some more radical, let's say, ideas that we're also looking at that would, um, um, you know, there's, there's 12 months out of the year. I mean, right. So there's the summers of the summers where I'm not suggesting we're playing in the summer. Don't get me wrong, but I think there's different kinds of, it, it, it really depends Uh, to what extent ULIB and FIBA and EuroLeague can get into a room and are serious about trying to work this out. I can tell you that we're serious, and I can tell you that I believe, we haven't met with ULIB yet, I haven't met with ULIB yet, but FIBA and ULIB, of course, are very close, and my sense is that FIBA is very serious. The problem is that just before the, this interview, I read some quotes by the president of ULIB, Thomas Van der Spiegel. Yeah, those quotes were very unfortunate. Yeah, he just said that your league is killing European basketball. Yeah, so it's, it's hard to imagine some, some compromise in that I don't know. Tom, right? I don't know Thomas, but I got to be honest with you. I mean, I just, I find statements like that to be really disappointing because that's, it's, it's a negative statement. I mean, why can't we sit down and work this out instead of making statements that say we should go back to how it was 25 years ago. I mean, people want to see the best players and the best teams and the highest level, right? And yet the domestic leagues are really important. I'm not denying that. I'm not anti-domestic league. You know, there was talk at one time, you probably know this, about your league clubs leaving the domestic leagues. You're not hearing me talk about that. I'm fine with the domestic leagues. I understand that Barca and Real Madrid ought to play in the ACB. I'm not against that. Uh, so I think if we can sit uh, and, 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 and I think we can make sense of it, I do think there are solutions. There's one thing that I wanted to clarify about, about Dubai's market, actually. And it's actually related to London's market as well. because. <coughs> I think it was Joe's podcast, actually, yeah. uh, where you mentioned that there might be even two teams in London market. And there's a rumor, which I heard that maybe it's also uh, the same in Dubai, potentially having two teams. Is, is that possible? Yeah, it's expansions? not been on the table yeah. at all, has not been discussed. And I, there, there I, were, I mean, I think that one team at a time, there's not even a league there yet. Yeah. <laughs> And there were many misconceptions about Dubai's market, for example, right? Mm. A lot of people think that, oh, 
to buy just coming here in the year league nope. throwing a lot of money and nope. everybody gets richer it's it's way different it's no, like no, a business no, no, no. model some business concept we no, are talking they, about they they're like any other market they they want to have a euro league team they have a market they have something that not every european market has they have a brand new really nice state of the art arena with over so I think effectively 17,000 potentially basketball seats. Um, and it's a great market. It's a wealthy market. It's a market that wants to have entertainment and wants more sports. So it wouldn't make sense not to be engaging and talking to them. Whether we can work out a deal that makes sense for everybody, I don't know yet. We're still talking. But um, it's certainly an attractive opportunity. I don't think EuroLeague has to only be inside the borders, the formal, bo the formal borders of Europe. And just for the very end, we have a sh few quick questions from Basket News Plus members. Cool. These are our fans, our subscribers that they can become on basketnews.com slash uh, plus. And they have this privilege to be a part of interviews uh, we are making. I like that. These are just short questions. Some of them, they were already covered uh, throughout all, uh, our conversation. But there's this one, for example, coming from Ivan. Uh, are you thinking about games schedule time for the upcoming season so that we can watch more games? For example, first match to start uh, uh, to start at eight o'clock and the last mm. one at nine o'clock. I mean, just not to have games clashing, as Mike James and Donatus Motivnas also mentioned, mentioned in our mm. previous podcast. I think it's a good idea. We'll talk about it. I, we really ha it hasn't been brought to my attention before. I think game times um, are heavily influenced by television and then local culture. I mean, I think is right. I, you know, here in Barca, I mean, the, when the game started at 8.30, I'm going tonight, 8.30, in the NBA, it's halftime. Or, or you're, you're, you're midway through the third quarter by 8.30. You know, we, we have, we eat it, we don't eat at 10 o'clock in the United States. Here we eat at 10 o'clock. So everything happens later. So I think it's not, something that we can just wave a wand and change, but I think that's a good point. The other question is coming from Odris Poshkavich. Uh, you have a history of working with the, within the NBA environment. What part of the NBA business approach would you like to implement to the EuroLeague? Players, 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 players are the stars. People care about and are drawn to these great young athletes who are also people and they, and they, and they, and they're, you know, they're attractive and they're healthy and they symbolize, um, diversity. I mean, it's pretty incredible. It's just looking into a huddle when they're all huddling during a timeout and seeing the diversity in, in that huddle and people coming from different parts of the world. This is the first thing I noticed when I came here and had attended my first general assembly and had to wear headsets to listen to translation. And at the time, I think there were 13 languages being spoken. And that's, that's, that's an incredible thing. So to me, um, the NBA has been about diversity too. And I think we should pick up on that idea. The NBA is also a show. And maybe, arguably, for some people, it's more show than it is basketball. I don't know if that's fair, by the way. I think the NBA is pretty high-level basketball. I, you know, they're, they're athletes, and the skill level of the NBA is really extraordinary. Uh, but I just, uh, I guess the other thing I would say is that we need to acknowledge that this is a business. Business is not a dirty word. Business is not an anti-fan word. It's not being a business means that we will have more resources to begin to do the kinds of things that fans want us to do, which is uh, to have all-star games and to have opportunities, you know, to be able to play more. I'd like to make our players our partners. You know, this is a key. This now, now I'm thinking of the right answer to your question. The salary cap in the NBA is not a salary cap. That was a stupid title. It's a partnership with the players. The players are guaranteed over half, I think it's 53% now, of what they call defined gross revenues. It means when the year, when the league grows, the players make more money. 
That's what it means. And that partnership has created an environment where there's cooperation between the league, the players, and now the coaches, and everybody's benefiting. The journalists are benefiting, the PR director is benefiting, the CEO is benefiting, the fans are benefiting also, in my opinion. And it's been good for basketball, and uh, I like that. I mean, the NBA is a closed league. There are big differences between Europe. I think, you know, being an entirely closed league is not, you know, something that's that easy to do here. But, um, you know, we're, we're a semi-closed league, right? So, uh, but, and I, and I, so I just think it's putting really smart people, innovative people, taking advantage of technology and putting them in a position to succeed. Uh, so treating this like a business would be my first priority. And the last question coming from Beyond Plus member, uh, you have a, coming from Odrus, you have a broadcasting background. What is your plan to develop the broadcasting of the EuroLeague to showcase to a broader audience? But I would also rephrase the question just to improve the quality of yeah. broadcasting. Well, challenging. Um, <laughs> Alex and I have lots of conversations about this. I think IMG's done a really terrific job along with Alex and his team. I think it has improved dramatically. It, the, the issue is it, uh, it, it varies from country to country because you need directors, number one. To me, the most important job is the producer and the director. And these people need to know the game. They need to understand the game so it's cut right. Sometimes the directors make mistakes in terms of how they cut the game. So I'd like to see, you know, we'd like to see better uh, infrastructure on site at the locations. Some trucks have limited infrastructure, whether it's camera quality, graphics quality, whatever. They're using sometimes not the most state-of-the-art, up-to-date equipment. These things are money issues. You can, you know, so you can imagine that there's vast differences. You come from a basketball country. That means we tend to get better production, right? Uh, but in some less basketball countries, it's not as good because you don't have as much experience. When I worked at the NBA in broadcasting, I had the good fortune of sitting in the truck with CBS and they had a guy named Michael Burks sitting next to Sandy Grossman. I mean, these guys in their own right inside the industry became famous. And Sandy Grossman used to just, I just, he blew me away. It's like, he, it's live. And he knew what was gonna happen before it happened. And his cameras were there and ready for the reaction shot the drama of the moment because he would, he knew the game so well, he could anticipate different scenarios, different outcomes, and his cameras were there. And the guy running the graphics had the right graphic to put over the screen that complemented and enhanced um, what the pictures were. Um, I'd like to see our commentary get better, you know? I'd like to see more engaged people that really know the game. I'd like to see more ex-players. I mean, I was interviewed uh, the, by the Squeak guys doing the game in Monaco the other night, and these guys were ex-players, man. They knew the game. Shout they were to ballers, Al you know? and Alan yeah, yeah, they were great, and they were asking really good questions. And so I'd like to see more of, more of those kinds of people. You know, sometimes I turn on games and I hear these play-by-play -play guys and they just blah, 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 blah. I mean, it's like, you're telling me what I can see. I can already see it. So add something to the experience. Don't tell me what I can already see with my eyes. I don't need to hear you tell me what I can see with my eyes. I need you to add more information and make this experience better. I mean, I could go on and on on this topic, right? We should have different feeds, you know, about Manning cast in football. This is cool. I mean, so they've got the regular broadcast, but I can flip over to a different channel and I can watch Eli and Peyton sitting on a couch like I am, like they're in their living room talking about the game. That's fascinating. And we've got more and more technology now where you can be your own commentator. We're even giving fans control over cameras, letting them be the director. Maybe I'd like to watch the game from over here instead of over here. This is cool. So we're pursuing all those things, of course. But, you know, we have, we have a ways to go. Just the last question coming from me. You don't need to expand with this one, but 
Give us a short teaser. How do you visualize the year like in, let's say, 2026? I think it's the year when the IMG contract expires, right? And it's, I would say, three years, it's pretty enough to do some changes, right? So how do you visualize this, this company? Um, I'd like to have a, um, um, I, I kind of have a less is more perspective, you know, rather, you know, so I'm talking, you know, partners, right? I'd like to have a handful of partners who are really committed to helping us grow and taking this sort of growth journey with us. Global brands that, so it's not about just advertising and sticking logos, but it's more about an engaging relationship. So I'd like to see that. I'd like to address what you're talking about. I'd like to see, you know, meeting production values. So it's consistent across all the countries. I'd like to see much deeper and more interesting digital content. I'd like to see us grow the sport to, you know, maybe 24 teams so that we can take advantage. So we have clubs and for sure in London, for sure in Paris, Monaco, Belgrade, Bologna, Valencia, these markets, I'd like to take advantage of that. I hope that we can welcome our friends in Moscow back into the competition. Sesk has always been a great team, so I pray that that situation gets resolved so we can welcome them back uh, in that period of time. Um, so I guess those, you know, I'd, I'd like to be able to have meetings with FIBA that are collaborative, not adversarial. And so we're working together to solve and make basketball uh, uh, more important, more part of the mainstream. So that's something that's a high priority for us. And, uh, you know, I guess I'd like to see a, uh, you know, I want to see my son, who's 22 years old, but more than him because he's my son. So he kind of has to like EuroLeague. If he doesn't like EuroLeague, he's in trouble. But. I want him to get all of his basketball loving friends, all of his NBA loving friends to to get turned on to your league. Not against the NBA, but as part of it, uh, so that they watch Luka Doncic when he's 16. And how old was he when he played at Real Madrid? 18. Yeah. yeah. So they know by the time he's at Real Madrid, they know, hey man, that guy's gonna be a big time. He's gonna be a big time player. I can see that. Young people are into these stories. They want to see these guys when they're young and, and move up. I like at some point to bring the women's game into the mix. Uh, I'm a big, I know it's been a long, it's taken a long time, but I'm a big believer in the WNBA and David Stern stuck with that at times when people said that, you know, that should go out of business. No, he stuck with it. It was important. So I don't know. That's, is that enough of an That's enough. Okay. okay. Best of luck in growing Thank this you. great product. And Appreciate thanks a lot for the conversation. My pleasure.